Okay, Michael, thank you very much for that fantastic introduction to all the various things that are happening in the, in the Northern Ireland scene, as it were. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today's event. We really appreciate your support. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to pre present and brief the findings of a research project that my colleague Tony Wall is sitting in the audience here, and myself and a few others have been involved in. And really, this short presentation will not really do justice to all the findings that we found. So we've brought along a copy of our executive summary report and an infographic and um, another little inset. And the reports are down at the back there. So for anyone who hasn't got one, if you maybe pick one up on your way out. Now, what we did in our report, or in our research, sorry, we investigated a number of gender equality issues at the most senior, or what we call the executive level of the Northern Ireland public sector. And what I wanted to focus on more today is the findings of the third stage of the project. But just I want to give you a little bit, bit of background first of all. So the research project was funded yet independent of OFM, DFM, and we uh, adopted a three-stage approach and that invo involves significant engagement with the five organizational types down the right hand side here. During stage one, we collected and analyzed secondary data from 143 public sector organizations. And we did that in order to provide baseline data because believe it or not, the data just wasn't out there right across the public sector. And we collected data with respect to 2,308 positions, senior positions. In stage two, we then went on to investigate some of the gender equality issues that we wanted to look at. And we carried out a survey of both male and female, both current and aspiring executives. And we looked at a number of things like barriers, enablers, etc. And we got a significant response of 3,186. And then the final stage, we carried out 107 interviews of approximately one to maybe one and a half, or even one went on for about four hours, I think, um, interviews with current and aspiring executives, again, males and females. And we thought this was terribly important to get the male versus the, the female perspective. So that's what we did. So in terms of uh, what I want to do before going on to stage three, I just want to briefly summarize some of the findings from stages one and two, and you'll see more details about that in the report at the back of the room. First thing we found is that there was a degree of inequality amongst, uh, sorry, in the gender composition at the executive level between males and females. Now, we, we expected that. So about 71% of all senior positions right across the public sector are held by males, and 29% are held by females. We also found variation in the gender composition across the five types of organizations that we looked at. Health and social care organizations, you can see there, have the highest levels of equality. But as Michael has just pointed out, 81% of uh, individuals within health and social care are females. So we would actually expect that to be the other way around, given that there are a number of females already there. Michael also alluded to two other things, vertical and horizontal segregation. And we did find evidence of vertical segregation. You can see here at the top of the slide, the males hold the majority, 79% of all chief executive positions within the Northern Ireland public sector. At the bottom, you can see evidence of horizontal segregation. You can see that males tend to predominantly hold the senior positions with respect to finance, strategy, corporate services, and operations. And then we have human resources over there, and females tend to dominate that. So I, th I think we're probably not telling you something you don't already know. We also found that where an organization has either a female chief executive or a female chairperson, that that has a positive impact on the number of females at that senior level, and that's actually quite positive. So that's really briefly summarizing the findings from stage one. Moving on briefly to summarize stage two findings, and again, I'm, I'm not doing this justice at all. As I said earlier, we received 3,186 responses, and that comprised 47% males and the remainder females. The majority of those people who responded have caring responsibilities for either children or elderly relatives. So they're speaking from a position of knowing what's happening. The majority are well qualified, and the majority have what we would call a long-term career in the public sector, i.e. more than 20 years. And that's what you'd expect, because they're either ex assisting, uh, sorry, current as executives or aspiring executives, so you'd expect that. 
Now, one of the issues that we looked at, or we, and we were very interested in, was the, this issue of opting out of career progression. And we asked respondents if they had opted out, and a whopping 42% of all those who responded, that's 1,058 people, claimed that, or suggested that they had opted out of career progression for a number of reasons. So if you look at the top reason, caring responsibilities for dependents, well, there's really nothing that organizations can do about that. But there are a number of things here that organizations can do something about. Long hours, culture, unsupportive work environment, lack of flexible working, inhospitable organizational culture. Those are all major reasons individuals have given us for opting out. There were other reasons given, but they're not on this slide. For example, bias in the selection process and stress in the workplace was also uh, quoted by individuals. We did some further analysis on this particular data. It's not reported here, but the majority of those opting out are female. They're aged between 46 and 55. They've got high levels of qualifications, and they're employed right across the public sector. OK, so one of the other things that we looked at in stage two was what sort of enablers uh, would enable one to prog progress their career. So we're looking at enablers, both those related to the individuals themselves and their organizations. And you can see here, this is the male and the female attitudes combined. And uh, we're using here a word cloud. And just take note that where we have larger writing, that means that it's more significant than, than smaller um, font size. So you can see there's a whole range of enablers there to career progression. And actually, what's really good about this is that males and females agree that these are enablers. When we come on to look at barriers, and again, I'm only presenting a snapshot of what we found, we asked individuals what sort of barriers are there with respect to your career progression. And we had a whole raft of uh, barriers identified. However, this is uh, quite important here. When we compare male and female perceptions, Females alone identified a number of additional impediments, and here they are. And to some extent, I think, Michael, in reflecting on what you've just said, it reflects this issue of work and caring. For example, long hours, culture, lack of recognition of work-life balance. Remember, these are barriers that females are saying are relevant to them, but males are saying they're not relevant to them. So maybe we're just getting a continuation of what we already know. In stage two, we also asked various issues around individuals' organizational culture, their gender culture, and female stereotyping. And this slide provides a summary. Now, I know it's very, very, there's a lot in there. Uh, but it provides a summary, again, of the statements to which females only indicated their agreement. So these are all the things that females are saying, I agree with this, but males are saying they didn't agree with it. So things like, within my organization, an informal culture of jobs for the voice still prevails. Women have to perform much better than males to succeed. And I think this slide um, indicates to us that there are very conflicting views. Remember, these are perceptions, OK? You may not agree with all of them, but this is what these individuals as are telling us. So there's very different views with respect to both organizational, the gender culture within that organization, and stereotypical attitudes across the public sector. Now, moving on then to stage three, which is where I wanted to spend a little bit more time. Um, what we did, we, as I've already suggested, we carried out 107 interviews with both male and female current and aspiring executives. So uh, that would be, for example, with CEOs, permanent secretaries, directors, um, assistant directors, uh, senior managers. Also, we, 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 in the civil service, we would have interviewed down to grade seven they would have been classified as an aspiring executive. And we identified or investigated, sorry, seven themes. So I'll just go through each of these in turn. Sorry, there's a lot of, uh, maybe if you can kind of listen and read at the same time. So with respect to theme one, so we were looking at what were individuals' perceptions of the gender composition of the board that, you know, within their organization, but also of the public sector generally. And the majority of interviewees did indicate that the gender composition of their senior management board and of the Northern Ireland public sector was an issue. So this is really just confirming what we found in stage one, that there is this element of inequality and people are recognizing it. Now, despite that broad agreement, we did identify 
there were, there were males were generally, or, or some males, sorry, were more inclined to suggest that the gender composition of their senior management board and of the Northern Ireland public sector in general was, it was less of an issue than females. So females tend to view it more of an issue when compared to males. And of course, there was some variation right across the public sector with respect to that. Moving on then to theme two, where we looked specifically at organisations' gender culture, and uh, there were a number of findings here. For example, with respect to the senior civil service, the majority of females viewed the culture of the senior civil service as, they, they used some rather harsh words, competitive, unsupportive, blame culture, where some departments, uh, you know, within some departments, sorry, which has the potential to impact upon males more so than females. Now, it wasn't across the board in all departments, just in some departments. In contrast, interviewees within local government, they generally perceived the organization, their organization, sorry, gender culture as positive and also as having improved over time. And there was a lot, when we spoke to people from local government, there was a lot of references to the, what was called the Local Government Staff Commission's Women in Councils Initiative and particularly the influence of female councillors. But that initiative has been go ongoing for many years now, and gender equality has become you know, something that has improved as a result. Elsewhere, there were mixed views. So, for example, some interviewees expressed an unhealthy blame culture again within health, and um, there were some uh, references made to male-dominated environments within NDBBs. Surprisingly, education um, was really the only sector where people thought everything was fine and hun hunky-dory, as it were. Now, one other thing that we looked at with respect to gender culture, we looked at the interaction between males and females in the workplace and during meetings. And the only issue we were able to report there was again within the senior civil service where some females r reported feelings of being marginalised and isolated within senior meetings. And that really contrasts with local government, really where the only thing of any note was the timing of uh, meetings, council meetings. Now you'll be glad to hear that we also uh, it was also we were also told when we spoke to people that the workings of what we would describe as the old boys network has effectively declined over the years and that's actually very good. However, some interviewees still recognised that there were informal male networks going on. They were largely based around sporting activities. And of course, females are hardly going to go and play five-a-side football or whatever it might be. But maybe that's something that females should think a little bit more about. Moving on to stay or theme three, we wanted to investigate a range of issues around flexible working. Um, and this is, this is an issue that keeps appearing in, in many different reports which look at gender. And this slide really summarises the key issues that we uncovered in our research. First of all, let me say, without exception, all of the organisations that we spoke to, they all have flexible working arrangements in place. And that would include things like compressed work and week and maybe term time working. Despite this, however, we, we found that there was a difference in the rhetoric and the reality of flexible working and that it was very difficult for individuals employed at a senior level to avail of flexible working. So whilst they, it was available to them, the, it, the reality was very much different. And that, the only exception to that was within health where there seemed to be more women and they kind of made it work for themselves. The other things, just to pick up on some of the things in the slide here, the majority of interviewees, that would include both males and females, they're saying that organisations expect senior managers to work on a full-time basis. They also suggest that there's a lack of willingness to examine job redesign, so there's nothing going on that's active. Um, and there's a lack of, you know, thinking about it, agile working or homework and to facilitate any sort of flexible working, uh, you know, in any serious way. Furthermore, the majority of people we spoke to, they said it's just not possible to get to the senior level of an organisation. If you think you're going to be working on a, on a flexible uh, you know, pattern, it's not going to happen for you. And 
that was again that was common throughout the public sector, with the exception of health. Health seems to be we found they were leading the way. Finally, as, as there's a couple of things up there, there were a, no, a number of negative perceptions of those people who were actually availing of flexible working. Now that's not just females, that's also males. So they had feelings of guilt, for example, for not being in the office full time in comparison to their full time colleagues. And there also was this general perception from both those availing and other people who weren't availing that these people just weren't really committed to the organization. I find that very worrying. Okay, theme four. Uh, we investigated a number of issues around work-life balance. I think, look, the main finding here is that contrary to what the popular media seem to think and what the private sector seem to think, the work-life balance of individuals employed at senior levels of the public sector is generally described as very poor. 24-7 came up quite a lot. And there were a number of issues around that there. So, for example, um, the, the poor work-life balance was associated with a long hours culture. There's also a lack of role models in terms of senior people leading by example. You know, sending emails at two and three in the morning and expecting people to reply to them. There's also the demanding nature of senior roles, which of course you would get in the private sector also. But also we have up there on the left and side the demanding nature of politicians. So all of those things combine to give a poor work-life balance for people at the senior level. And also some people seem to say that this poor work-life balance was something that affected females more so than males. Okay, so. Another issue that we looked at, and Michael, you alluded to this as well earlier on, was opportunities around advancement, recruitment, and progression. There was a whole lot of things we found here. I'll not go through all of them. One of the things was uh, the majority of interviewees say that training and education is, of course, important. But there was some recognition that there are fewer quality training programs around these days when compared to, say, maybe five to ten years ago. And that's largely attributed to budgetary constraints. Michael, you mentioned mentoring. Mentoring was also identified as important, particularly for females. However, we did identify some problems with mentoring around mentor matching the mentors with the mentees, etc. So, and there was definitely variation, variation, so there doesn't seem to be any sharing of information about what a good mentoring program might look like within the, right across the public sector. We also um, t d looked at uh, allocation of secondments, acting up opportunities, challenging visible assignments, and individuals all said, well, yes, those sorts of things are really excellent for career progression and you need them. But there was some uh, concerns regarding how these opportunities were actually allocated. Just a few other things, performance appraisals. Um, the majority of interviewees said that within their organization it was really just a tick box exercise. It really didn't have anything to do with progression. Also, there's a lack of uh, succession planning, both at an organizational level and a right across the public sector, or even at a sectorial level, there's none of that. With respect to this one in the middle, recruitment and selection, Everyone we spoke to said that they agree with the merit principle. Every single person agrees with that. And also individuals also agreed that within their own organizations they perceived the, the uh, recruitment selection processes to be fair and transparent. The only thing about those was that some individuals said that competency-based interviews tend to favor males more so than females because males use the word I more than we. And it was perceived that assessment centres might provide a better uh, and more equitable environment for candidates wishing to seek promotion. And then the last thing was we also, uh, we also found some um, findings with respect to opting out, which really just support what we found in stage two, that there are a lot of pressures on senior management roles and also inhospitable work environments contribute to individuals uh, wanting to opt out of career progression. Okay, moving on then to theme six. What we were trying to do here, we were trying to get a sense from the people that we interviewed. Do you think there are benefits to having a balanced gender board? I mean, that's essentially the question we asked them and then we opened it up a little bit. 
And this is fantastic. Every single person that we spoke to, there wasn't one that dissented. Everybody said, yes, we think it's great. We should have more balanced gender boards. Some people were speaking or uh, reflecting on their experiences of having an all-male or indeed an all-female board. And the sorts of benefits that people extolled with for a ba balanced gender board were things like facilitating, it facilitates different perspectives, positively changing or moderating behaviors, it incorporates softer skills. And in fact, a lot of people went on to say that if you have a balanced gender board, it leads to more deliberative, collaborative, and careful decision making. So that's quite important. So people seem to be buying into this idea that it is a good thing. Now in the last theme, what we wanted to ascertain, we wanted to find out you know, what are the things you think would need to happen in order to, to, gen or to attain greater equality at these senior levels. And there were two main things, and we didn't guide the interviewees, two main things here. There was first of all the use of targets as opposed to quotas. So uh, people within local government and senior civil service in particular supported targets, not quotas. I should say that there's a lot of ignorance out there about what a quota actually is and the workings of it, and there's a lot of negative kind of um, negativity around the PSNI's uh, quota targets and or quotas, sorry, and the fact that possibly some people don't seem to think that they've worked, but anyway. Um, now, even though there was greater support for targets, a number of interviewees they still expressed concerns around targets. For example, they said, well, you know, there's no point in setting a target if it's unrealistic or unachievable because it's only going to demotivate. And there were also, you know, what would you do if you don't meet the, the targets? What would the consequences of that be? Another um, issue that came out of this theme was the very positive role that a gender champion can play in terms of promoting a positive culture within the organization and really just uh, mainstreaming gender issues at the senior levels of organization. And as I said earlier, um, there was very positive uh, feedback from the local government um, sector where they have had gender champions both at the management level and at the council level for many years now. So I think that's certainly a, you know, a, a case that we can look at and learn from. So that's really finished now the, uh, the various themes that we looked at. The, what we do as a result of the, all of the data that we've collected from the three stages, we make a number of recommendations in order to try and move the agenda. Categorize these under four headings, strategic policy, process, and data. So I'll not go through all of these, but with respect to strategic recommendations, we suggest that organizations or sectors, however you might want to put that, should consider setting targets to assure equal participation of males and females. So a minimum of 40% males and females. We're also suggesting that organizations should identify a gender champion, preferably someone who's employed at the very senior levels, and preferably a man, by the way, because we think men probably have a better chance of, of pushing this agenda forward. And that those gender champions would take responsibility for setting and achieving targets and also the promotion of a gender inclusive culture. There are a few other things, but I'll not go through those. Got them in your slide. We make a number of policy recommendations in terms of developing a gender inclusive culture at the senior management level, which is going to promote and uh, accept the use of flexible working. As I've already said, there wasn't really much flexible working going on at these senior levels. And also a culture which promotes an appropriate work-life balance. I think that's something that seriously needs to be considered. We also make a number of policy recommendations around career development opportunities, mentoring, and linking performance ma management more clearly to career development. And finally, we make a number of data analysis recommendations around two things. First of all, collecting data about senior appointments in much the same way that the public appointments process does on a yearly basis and publishes that information. And secondly, data collection with respect to the barriers that organizations and sectors continue to face. Okay, so I think what we'd like to say towards the end of this look is that our research, you know, we have found some examples of good practice, but I think we're saying that more needs to be done. 
We have a number of good examples of best practice and within the, that uh, document at the back we've highlighted I think it's four examples of good practice and you can maybe read a little bit more about those. So we've mentioned the local government women and locals councils initiative but also there is other there are other initiatives like for example the chief executives forum women's leadership initiative and both of those initiatives have helped develop leadership capacity and they've also helped address gender inequalities at the senior levels. Okay, so just let me conclude in addition to some of these best practice. As Michael has already suggested, there have been some recent developments within the local public sector which are worthy of note. First of all, the reforms within local government have resulted in substantial improved representation of female and director post level and the, the current representation at those two levels when combined is actually 44% which is very welcoming. I think the local government sector have a very open attitude towards gender but again more can be done. And secondly within the civil service a number of developments have recently taken place and Michael you talked about those earlier. So the appointment of a gender diversity champion and that's currently shared between Peter May and Noel Lavery as joint diversity champions and also the setting up of a senior women's network within, within the senior civil service and this started to do some work in terms of looking at for example the barriers and looking at mentoring and how that can help. However I think our research team we would suggest that despite these developments more needs to be done. If we as a society, if we are going to buy into the benefits of gender balance board, and you've seen in my slide earlier on that the majority of, well everybody that we spoke to, they all buy into the, the benefits of gender balance board, well we would suggest that further change is needed. For example, we are arguing that organisations need to commit to setting and achieving gender targets in much the same way that the public appointments process is recently done, I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Uh, and we also would suggest that we need more sharing of best practice. There's not enough, there's too much of a silo mentality where the good things that are happening in one part of the public sector are in no way shared or communicated even with other parts of the sector. And we basically, we hope that the research that we have undertaken and the findings published, we hope that they're going to act as some sort of a catalyst to bring about change within senior management boards. And I think that's already started to happen. So thank you very much. Thank you.